Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, last Sunday I published this you know, rather beautiful picture of the Moon and Venus on the internet. Posted it to my Twitter, at which point people started coming back with their own pictures. And Monev44 uh, showed me his picture and wondered whether there would be any observable parallax there. Now, parallax is basically where you have two slightly different viewpoints of the same object. They will have slightly different angular positions. But moreover, if you can measure the parallax, you can actually figure out the distance to the object if you know where your observers are standing. So we thought, let's try and measure the distance to the moon using nothing more than cameras. I would be in California and he would be over 2,000 miles away in upstate New York. So on Thursday night, as soon as it became possible for me to take pictures of stars, I got a picture of the moon with some stars. And we synchronized our clocks so that he would take pictures at exactly the same time. Now that we have the two images, we want to measure them so that we can tell whether the moon is in a slightly different position. And what we did was we essentially overlaid the two photographs and then rotated and adjusted them until the three brightest stars lined up perfectly on both images. So we can see that between the east coast and the west coast, the moon is in a slightly different position, but we want to measure this. So we identify the three brightest stars. Now we need to figure out which stars they are, so we go to a sky map that shows us that these are three stars from the constellation of Virgo. We can even read out their actual coordinates in the sky in right ascension and declination. And that's important because then we need to use that to scale the distances on our photographs. So we measure the distance between the first pair and we get a distance of 1560 pixels. On the sky, we know that that's 4.341 degrees. So from that, we surmise that our photograph has a scaling of 359.5 pixels per degree on the sky. And since we have three stars, we can actually do that for the other pairs, and we get a scaling of 356.9 and 357.2. So we're all roughly in agreement. Finally, we find a common reference point on both moon images. So I use the uh, furthest point on the dark side of the moon. I don't use the light side of the moon because it's so bright, so overexposed to make the stars visible, that the light is actually bleeding over into neighbouring pixels. But on the dark side, it's only illuminated by Earthshine. So I can get a pretty good measurement here. And between the two images, I measure a difference of 112 pixels. And based on the scaling we've seen elsewhere, where that's 0.312 degrees. And for small parallaxes, you can figure out the distance by dividing the baseline length by the parallax and then multiplying by 57.3, essentially to convert from degrees into radians. But figuring out the baseline was actually a little more complicated than simply dragging a line between two places on a map because each place was on the surface of a three-dimensional globe. If the moon happened to be right in the middle of the US, then yes, we could do that. But uh, when we looked at the actual positions of the moon on the sky, figured out the altitude and the azimuth, well, it turns out that the moon was more like seeing this angle. So the distance between these two spots on this map is what we had to use. And I actually ended up descending into the twin hells of spreadsheets and spherical trigonometry because regular trigonometry only works on a plane. We have a special type of trigonometry that works on the surface of spheres. So using all that and then projecting everything back onto the, the plane, yeah, we got a baseline of about 1885 kilometers. So plugging that baseline back into the parallax equation, we get a distance of 346,000 kilometers, which isn't quite right. The real distance is more like 384. So, you know, this is about 10% of the ac accuracy. I mean, I think I could definitely do better. First of all, the geometry we ended up with was lousy. We basically had to shoot before it set on the East Coast. If you're going to do this, it's actually better to do it in a north-south configuration so that everybody has roughly the same sunrise and, or moonrise and moonset. I did also try another way of measuring the motion of the moon that didn't require to, me to overlay the images, just measured the, the distances to the known reference stars and then do a whole bunch of math. That gave me a slightly higher parallax of 0.315, which actually made the result worse. Now, it was great working cross-country with Manev44, but uh, I'm going to say it's actually technically possible 
to measure or at least estimate the distance to the moon using just a single camera and different times. So here's two different zoomed in shots of the moon taken at different times. The one on the left was taken when the moon is high in the sky. The one on the right was taken when it was down near the horizon. Remember when I said that you have to account for the fact that the observers are on the surface of a globe? Well, that means that when the moon is down near the horizon, that uh, it's actually got a little further to go, so in theory it should be slightly smaller than when the moon is directly overhead. Because when it's directly overhead, it's about 6,500 kilometers closer to us. So using the magic of graphical manipulation, we can fold these two halves together at the same scale, be clear. And lo and behold, there is a very small difference between the moon that was pictured at the horizon and the moon that was pictured at a highest altitude. That is the highest angular altitude above the horizon. One of the nice things about this technique is you can actually take photos of the moon during the daylight. So this image, which was taken uh, when the moon was about 40 degrees above the horizon, by ma my math, that puts it about 4,100 kilometers closer. And being just that little bit closer made it 1.2% larger. So what you do is you divide 4,100 by 0 0.012 and you get 341,000 kilometers. So again, that's a pretty good number, but I'm actually surprised at how good that is given how much scope there is for, uh, you know, measurement errors. Anyway, I'd made this video just to show that you can actually measure these astronomical distances using essentially consumer-grade hardware. After all, it's a whole lot better than what astronomers used to use to measure these great distances. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.